it's very easy for engineering and technical folks to gravitate towards, you know, want to go to the big shiny object, but we want to make sure it's kind of a, a tried and tested, and there's always a budget element to it, too. Hi, you're listening to The Secure Developer. It's part of the MyDevSecOps community, a platform for developers, operators, and security people to share their views and practices on DevSecOps, Dev and Sec collaboration, cloud security, and more. Check out mydevsecops.io to join the community and find other great resources. This podcast is sponsored by Sneak. Sneak is a dev-first security company, helping companies fix vulnerabilities in open source components and containers without slowing down development. To learn more, visit sneak.io. On today's episode, Guy Pajani, president and co-founder of Sneak, talks to Jeff Kirshner. Jeff has worked in high tech in Silicon Valley since 1995. He starts off his career with Sun Microsystems, moving on to eBay, PayPal, LiveOps, before joining a small company called AKF Partners, specializing in helping with high growth. He has had various roles in engineering, product, system operations, and IT, but has always gravitated back to security as it's a fascinating and challenging space. He's now the Chief Security Officer at Medallia, the world's leading customer experience platform. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Secure Developer. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we have with us someone who has kind of done this journey from from ops to security and now tackles a pretty sort of sizable amount of security as Chief Security Officer at Medallia. We have Jeff Kirshner. Thanks for coming on to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So, Jeff, before uh, we dig in, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what is it that you do and what was the journey that you took into, into security and into specifically your current role? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I've been in high technology for uh, about 25 years now. I came to the Bay Area in California in 1995 and started working at Sun Microsystems and went to eBay and PayPal and then a startup and then a consulting firm and now landed at Medallia as the chief security officer. I've had various roles. I started in technology operations and gravitated in and out of security throughout my career. It's always been a fascinating area for me. Actually, at my last consulting company prior to joining Medallia, we focused on high growth and high scale companies and helped companies that were dealing with uh, massive problems with just growing and scaling. And security always came up as a topic, too. And I was the most experienced in our firm around security. So we decided to start a security practice there. I got engaged with Medallia as part of that. And I've been really excited to help them build a strong security program there. So you got lured into the dark side. I don't know which one of them is the dark side. <laughs> but you got uh, you got lured into yeah. actually operating and running that from from the consulting side. Has that been very different? I mean, how's the shift from consulting to running the team? Well, the shift from consult. I mean, obviously, you have a bit more ownership when you're actually running the team and you have you know the day to day responsibilities and everything. It wasn't a hard shift because I. Everybody in our consulting firm was executives or leading large teams and stuff before in, a, in an operational capacity. So we weren't born consultants. But the biggest thing that I, I liked about Medallia when I came there is they had a, a security mindset from the be- beginning. It's not like we were introducing a new a new topic there. So that that is something that I was actually looking forward to in a company. Some, somebody that took it seriously understands how important it is to our customers that the privacy and security is an element that just you have has to be an element of how you run the business. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, you came in to lead a team, but the, the mindset was, was there. Let's maybe veer indeed right. into the organization. So what does it mean? You know, what, what does your organization look like? The, the, the chief security officer organization and, and maybe like, what was the journey? You've been there for about three or four years. How did that change as yep. you, as you grew? So when I joined the company, the security team had started, I think it was probably two or three years prior to that, where they really had, they had security people in the company, but they didn't really have a team until about two years prior to me joining. And it was really kind of just getting on its feet and and developing. The way that I structured it is really, it's, it's a pretty standard way to do it. So I have a risk and compliance department that's responsible for all our compliance programs. We have security operations in-house, so 24 by 7 security shop. And we have a, a large team that we call product or platform security that is responsible for all the aspects of SDLC, doing our penetration testing, to building and implementing tools that are integrated into our platform. My kind of philosophy on building a team around security is 
when you have a siloed security team, it doesn't work. When people look at you as an organization that makes all the rules and comes and sort of acts like a policing force or something like that, it has to be something that pervades the entire organization. But we also have a security engineering team that is responsible for building the security features that our customers use. So features around encryption, SSO, uh, all that kind of stuff they build and support. And they actually report, uh, their, their peers of mine that report in kind of dotted line into me and report into our CTO. But I think that's great that they have responsibility for, for you know, acting like engineers. And to take it a step further, we also have what's called a security champions program. We put that in place a couple of years ago. We have folks in every single engineering organization, sometimes more than one person if it's a larger team. But these are people that we run through a program. We actually get them a Stanford credential for, around security. So it, it's it's pretty enticing to them because, you know, it, security is interesting to a lot of people. We don't force anybody to do it. We get volunteers and they like it. They like to have that on the resume. It's a pretty, a pretty powerful thing. But this gives us an opportunity to not only have kind of go-to people that are thinking about security, but kind of a train the trainer approach. And that's how we really think about scaling the organization. So if there's a vulnerability in a certain you know, part of the platform, we know we, we know we have somebody that we can go to. But also, it really helps them think about security from the very beginning when they're building their products. I love the... Um champions program and, and the specific credential, uh, maybe digging into that a little bit. So this is, you said there's like one or more champions per team, you know, what, what does the team mean in this context? So like roughly, what would you say? Is the the team, a development team. Sorry to interrupt you. The, the end is like a, a development team. So our, our teams are engineering and development teams are aligned around our, our products. We have dozens of products on our platform and we have engineering teams that are aligned towards those engineering and product teams. So if there's a team around reporting, a team around APIs, a team around mobile, a team around all those different the different things, each one of those will have a security champion or champions who we can work with and develop through this program. So is it is it safe to say it's a roughly like a one to one to six, one to ten type ratio over the champion to it, or even more? Yes, depending on the team size. So you know, a team of ten might have one, a team of twenty might have two, a Got team, it. you know, that that kind of thing. And the other thing I, I like about it too is I don't think the right thing for any organization to do is to build a security empire either. I'm not about empire building. I'm about having a lean and very effective and efficient team the best talent that i can find on my team that works on obviously works on projects and works on on those various things but i want i I want a team that is kind of train the trainer and having an approach of everybody thinking about security not just my team for those people that are security champions is it an acknowledged beyond the credential is it an acknowledged part of their job do they have another responsibility, some expectation that some percentage of their time would be spent on supporting the other developers in security work? How does it work on the CTO side? It does. The expectation is that you'll have a certain percentage of time. Now, it varies by team. Typically, it's going to be anywhere from 10 to 20 on the low end to up to, you know, 30 to 40. In a lot of cases, though, some of the teams actually have, you know, a backlog or security work in their queue. So it can be more than that. But yeah, the expectations is a, a, a percentage of time through that program. Now, we, we typically do it for six months or a year and kind of refresh it. And sometimes people volunteer and they want to do it again, which is great. And sometimes there's, uh, sometimes, you know, people are just like, okay, now that I got that kind of training, I'll move on and somebody else will take, will take the turn. So it kind of varies team by team. Yeah. I think that's actually like an, an excellent idea in part is because it keeps it fresh and these people always yeah. know more, but also while you might have one champion on these 10 person team over time, there might actually be three people out of those 10 that, have been yeah. qualified and have kind of walked a mile in, in the security shoes and both have yeah. this sort of the subject matter knowledge, but also the empathy for the security needs. Yeah. My philosophy too is like security is going to fail at a company if it feels forced. You really have to have people understand and appreciate and own it. And that's why, you know, we, we do... We do a lot of top-down work around security. There has to be. I mean, you, you have to deliver results and manage risk and all that. But at the same time, if security is going to be successful at a company, I strongly believe that you have to get people to believe it and adopt it and make it, you know, have the mindset where, where people are really thinking thinking about it and want to do it. 
And we're fortunate in time that, especially in engineering team, cybersecurity is is you know a very very hot item. So it de- it definitely doesn't hurt to have you know some skill set on your resume surrounding that. It makes you very marketable. <laughs> yeah. Not that we want our people to be leaving and going somewhere else, but no, you know, it's, it's it's a very high in demand skill set. It's true value, right? Because it's valuable for you in the company and. You know, maybe unfortunately, you know, it's valuable when someone tries to hire them out of your company. But in the meantime, it's yeah. a motivation for them to sign up. And I love that Security Champions program. Thinking about that lean team that you run where you hire great people, what is it that you look for in a hire within your team? We want people that have strong security backgrounds or have great technical kind of acumen too, or, or compliance kind of acumen, business acumen. So I think having like, for, for the more technical roles, like our security operations team and our product security team, and I, I forgot to mention, we also do um, our own internal red teaming. We, ha- we have a, a do our own kind of ethical hacking and stuff like that. So that's one of the functions that we do. But for those teams, I think it's important for them to have kind of a broad range and, and skill set, not that ne- necessarily expertise in one area or another, but having folks that can really, you know, understand the technology stacks that we're working on and figure out how tools and, and systems and stuff can integrate with those. And I think um, a lot of the a lot of the roles on the risk and compliance side of is very customer facing. So we, we do a lot of work uh, producing collateral around security. We talk to customers all the time. We have customers in the, the Fortune 50 in various different verticals, from banking to telcos to, to government to, you know, healthcare and stuff like that. So very highly regulated and security conscious customers. And my team talks to them often and we, we have to, to convince them that our security is great. And for those folks, it's very important that, you know, they have they have sound business acumen and, and you know, they not only understand technology and compliance and, and security, but have the acumen to be able to talk about it to customers and explain, explain our features and, and the value that we can add as a security team. Got it. And I mean, this makes a lot of sense. And I think those are the engineers that help secure your own platform and therefore they communicate with customers to help build trust that their data right. and trusting you is legitimate, you know, that they're right. in safe hands. Separate from the engineering team that I think you mentioned reports to the CTO that builds specific security capabilities, some crypto capability or the other. Although I imagine that that team reporting to you is also deeply understands what has been built there so they can communicate that. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, we're, we're, we're connected at the hip with, with, the, with those teams there. But just the fact that they're more engaged in the engineering process and the build and, the, and, and all that, it makes them kind of move at a different pace and have, the, have priorities, but they're very closely aligned with, uh, with, the, with my team. The different structure. And how I do have a lot of influence over the product roadmap for our security, <laughs> as sure. you would imagine. And how important is it to you to have a uh, higher into your team know how to code, you know, actually like script code, how significant it, it is. It, it is important for a couple of reasons. So a lot of the tools and services that we implement, we're also responsible for doing the deployment of those to put deployment and support on the other end too. I'll take our product security team for as an example. They're the ones that work on our SDLC and manage our vulnerability programs for them. We do our own testing. We also hire third parties to do a lot of our testing it's very important for them to understand the code and understand the technology behind it because it, we're the ones that you know will triage and, and look at vulnerabilities. So if we're going to hand something off and, and find a vulnerability, whether it's through our own testing or through a third party, and hand it off to an engineering team, we don't want to, you know, we want to understand the context and offer solutions to them. Hey, you should do it this way or this way. Here's a recommendation for you. If you don't have that kind of skill set on your security team, you're going to lose some trust with engineering teams and IT teams and everybody. You have to have that technical acumen to be able to work with those teams and, and work with together with them on solutions. So I guess maybe indeed drilling into kind of that product security team work and, and shifting a bit into the engineering side. So you mentioned the security champions program. That's clearly one path of working with engineering. Yep. I, I imagine it's primarily the product security team. How do they work with the engineering work, for instance, around vulnerabilities, around tooling, and, and maybe even specifically yeah. around ownership? You know, who, who owns what aspect of the work there? Yeah, that's a great question. When we think of ownership, 
I'll kind of start there and, and unpack it the other way. When we think of ownership, we want the system owners and people that are building the products, just like people building, you know, supporting the, the server stacks and networks and all that to own the security, like the, the same way that they own availability, the same way they own quality, the same way that they own the features. When you get that kind of ownership, if there's a hack or an intrusion on your product, I think, you know, it was something that you built. I, I, I think it only makes sense that you'd feel some ownership and responsibility that, you know, you could have done something better. So with that regard, that's kind of the mindset that we, that we want to think. Having said that, the way that our team interacts with them is very much from the very beginning. We follow an agile process. We go through planning cycles and all that. From the very, very beginning, our team get, gets involved with designs, reviewing designs, doing thread analysis on designs. And when products are being developed, there's a whole process where the teams can create triggers and stuff that, that automatically uh, sends a signal to engage our team, our security team in reviewing, helping them at the kind of review stage of, you know, before the product gets really deep into development. And then at the other various stages too, we work with the engineering teams to help integrate tools that will help them automate the process for doing things and finding vulnerabilities early on in the process and giving them the tools that can uh, allows them to automate them so that, you know, we don't have to get, oh, we don't, we can find vulnerabilities early. They can, you know, or they can do it as they're building their products. So the ownership really lines, we own the tools, we own the design, they own the products. And where the two meet are through our SDLC process. Interesting. So I think there's a lot to unravel around that design aspect of it. So you mentioned there's a bunch of keywords or sort of signals that trigger engaging the the security team. Is that an automated process? Is it literally some keywords in in an issue or is it more guidelines? It's semi-automated. So there's product standards that, that we create. And through those product standards, it requires engineers and developers and product folks to fill out information about what they're building and based on how they answer the thing is this a new service is this going to be a new um a new type of data we're ingesting is it how we manage it something like that that will trigger oh this is going to require some security review so there's some kind of like self-answer q a and it's it's not perfect but it's pretty good it's pretty good at catching catching most things and that triggers an engagement from our team and that is a bit of a manual step but that's how it's done today but it's uh, if I echo this back, it, this tooling, this semi-automated process helps the development team know when to engage you and when they don't necessarily That's need correct. to engage you. And therefore, you reduce the number of times they do need to engage you to a smaller amount, which is manageable or allows you to scale. Yes. And that yes. is important to bring in that security expertise. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And. And the way it's, it's a very collaborative process too, because like I said, we have this product security team that, that works on this too, but we also have the security engineering team that builds a lot of features and stuff. They'll often also get engaged in, in helping some of the, or if there's a big thing that's, you know, data science and stuff where you're doing that, you know, kind of work around there, you know, that, that may require, okay, we really need to look at how we're designing the security around that. So it, it's a very collaborative effort. The, the thing that I really liked about how, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm going to take all the credit for this because we have a lot of wonderful people on the team. But when I got there, it was very much of an us versus them kind of organization. But it's really flipped. People come to us for help, which is great. People say, hey, you know, we're building this thing. Hey, we're thinking about this new product. Hey, I don't know if this seems like, you know, it might have some security issues. It's great that people are reaching out to us versus, oh, my God, here comes a security team. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I think that ability to collaborate and having the, the mutual love or mutual appreciation is really core for it. How is your um, product team structured towards the team? When you say they reach out to us, is there a, like a partner, a designated product security person that is mapped to a bunch of development teams? Is it you know, more of a pool? Not really. Yes, we're growing and scaling. We're, we do have folks that have more expertise in one area versus, versus the other. You know, in, you know, we have tons of different products um, on our service. We have you know, web intercepts, we have surveys, we have video, we have voice. There's Medalia, Medalia for Context basically is a company that does customer experience and creates 
it basically pulls, I use the word signals again, but signals from surveys to, you know, when you go on a website and you're asked to answer some questions about this or that, that's, that's often us, but there's, there's video, there's voice, there's all these new facets for how our customers engage with their customers. And that's what we're trying to help. We're trying to help pull in and give them rich information about those sources. So there's lots of different tech and technologies. We've actually acquired quite a few companies in the last two years. So, you know, they come with their, their technology stacks and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of impossible for one person to understand everything. So we are getting a little bit more specialized in our services. But in general, like I said, it's a relatively small team. There's a way that they can reach out to the group. And then we meet regularly and uh, triage and assign, say, this one's yours, this one's yours, and try to keep people around the areas where they're, they're most comfortable and most, uh, most knowledgeable. Got it. And I think with the Security Champions program, you also have people that are right there to engage so they might have their yeah. local kind of depth in the application, even if their security depth is not as deep, but it's substantial. And a bit of a topic of choice for me recently is really the whole world of cloud security. How do you think of product security versus cloud security? You think about cloud platforms, you think about containers, are those under the purview of the same teams? It's separate team. How do you see that delineation? It's actually interesting. So we've we've toyed with, toyed and tinkered with different names for our organization, but but cloud, it's very much that we we run our services in both our own co-located data centers and in, in some public cloud for for certain aspects. Most of it is in our own co-located, but we're software as a service. So yes, we have to think of think of the cloud and think about containers and all that. So all that kind of security blends together with with our team. So we have to think about how we're securing containers, how we're securing deployment. So we have the typical. De- development engineering organization that I was talking about that builds all the features and functions, but we also have a cloud organization that manages all our data centers, SRE type functions. So, you know, the the DevOps folks that are doing all the deployments and and all that kind of stuff. We work very, very closely and hand in hand with those those guys too. They're, They're also big partners with us. And just like the development teams, we work with those. The security champions program doesn't always necessarily fit in, but they're very security conscious. They also come to us. Us often, and we go to them. We partner with them. We meet with them every week. And the same thing when there's tools and stuff like that that we that we need, we work with them to select them, to build them, to deploy them, all that stuff. It, it's a partnership. And in this context, the the we is the same product security team. So, like within the security organization, it's it's the product security team that is the destination, or is that, there another team within the CISO team? It's actually both. It, it's it's depending on what it is. It's a combination of the product security team and a security operations team. So our security operations team does far more than just managing alerts and you know all that. They're actually building and supporting a lot of our our, our tools. They they respond. So like the scanners and stuff that we use. The selection of those, the working with the with the cloud teams to on deployment of those, all of those are between uh, more the infrastructure components generally fall more on the security operations side. Got it. And my favorite piece of technology that's in the twilight zone is containers. So who would you say mm-hmm. has the the responsibility right now to tackle container security? So secure the images. That's, it's a combination of my team, the security operations team, and working with the, the cloud organization, the, the SREs and the, the site reliability engineering team and the dev, DevOps world. So between, between us, we're the ones that are responsible for the security of those. Got it. And you've mentioned uh, several times, you know, owning the technologies or sort of giving the tools to help these other parts of the organization, you know, build securely. Maybe let's dig into that a little bit. Like, what do you look for in a security tool, in a security technology? What, uh, how do you uh, approach an evaluation yeah. of, a, of a security tool? That's a great question. So that's another thing that I've made sure that we've developed since we've been here. So when we're doing an evaluation of, of a tool or a platform or a service, we have a we have the you know the pretty thorough process that we go through. So first of all, my my approach to that is we don't necessarily want to go and find the latest, greatest, snazziest thing that isn't really well tested and really good. We, we don't want to be the first users of, of most tools. I, it's very interesting and it's very easy for engineering and technical folks to gravitate towards, you know, want to go to the big shiny object and, and stuff like that. But first of all, we want to make sure it's kind of a, a tried and tested and there's always a budget element to it too. So it doesn't, we don't necessarily want the most expensive thing. But I think the more important things 
that we look for is how it's going to fit into our technology and our stack and our ability to support it. You may have two tools that have the same kind of features and capabilities, but if you don't have the skill set to manage it and work with it, then there's no point in having it. You've got to go hire people to, to support it. So we look for something that will work across our technology stack. And, and like I said, it's getting a little bit more complex is where, you know, we've acquired some companies, we're expanding globally. Mm -hmm. There's lots of introduction of new technology. So it's important to the degree possible that a tool has to be able to support all the different technologies. It has to be able to operate in our data centers and in a public cloud if it needs to. So you'd have to be able to build and deploy it in all those locations. And I think the integration like into our SIM and all that is is important. You know, how, how are we going to be able to, to run the tool, collect data, make, make sure we can manage it effectively? All these different elements. We we have a process and a criteria that we go through to, to say, you know, how do we down select to a few? How do we run a proof, proof of concept to the site? And the other important thing, like I said before, is if there's an element, whether it's an SDLC tool, you know, something that we're going to integrate as part of the build and development process versus something that's going to run in our data centers, like, you know, a scanner, container security, something like that, then we have to get the teams that are responsible for those involved as well. And that's why it's great, for example, to have the security champions program too. So, you know, if we're selecting like, okay, we're going to do something new that, that does a static or dynamic analysis. Let's get a few people from the engineering team and make that the security champion project we work on together and figure out how we can get them engaged. In, in, and that, that's also, like I said, uh, not to give you your own little, little pitch for your own product, but, uh, but our, our developers loved it. And that's important to us. Our developers love Snape and found it very easy to use and all that. So that's great. You know, let's, let's do something that they're happy to work with as well. Yeah, that's awesome. First of all, you know, always, always appreciate kind of a, you know, a happy, a happy a, <laughs> yeah. a customer to it. But also, I, I just really give you like a little the, plug. The uh, the approach of ensuring that the sort of the relevant stakeholder is is indeed involved, and I especially yeah. like I think embedding the security champions, or once again raising the security champions program and how it plays a role here in being the the obvious entity that can appreciate the security needs on one hand and the application on the other. So I, I think that's really quite wise. I feel like I can grill you on uh, you know, more and more of these uh, questions, but I think we're, we're running a little bit low on time. So I'll just kind of jump to my typical uh, final question, uh, which is yeah, you bet. if you have one bit of advice or one tip or maybe even a pet peeve of something you want people to stop doing to give a team that is looking to level up their, their security foo, what would that be? And I'm going to give you a, a bit of a vague answer. I'm going to say it depends. I think you need to find out what the organization and what the group or the team thinks about security and adapt your answer towards that. And what I mean by that is if it's something that they're curious about or embrace or something like that, then it's great. Then, then you can figure out a way to kind of collaborate with. If they don't want to be thinking about security or have a bad experience, you need to convince them why it's important. And I think the biggest thing that's important and that, that I've learned o over the years of, you know, working with many companies from consulting to prior to that, you know, being in more operational roles. I think if you come in with a fixed approach to security, that's where you can fail. You have to understand where the organization is and what it needs and how they think about it. When I came into Medallia, I was actually consulting. Medallia was a client of mine for a while. And one of the things that I loved about it is top down at every level of the company, they believed that security was important. I didn't want to come into an organization as a CISO and say like, okay, we're just going to hire him and he's mm -hmm. going to sort of take care of that problem. I wanted to feel that we believe that this is an important part of our journey as a company. And not every person completely had that mindset, but it was pretty, pretty darn close. And what I learned is you have to, you know, be open, you have to listen to them, and you have to adapt your security messages based on the position that the leadership and the teams have. Yeah, I love that. You know, you have to sort of bring them along for the journey. You don't, you can't just sort of do it for them. They need to be true. That's right. Themselves as well. That's right. Jeff, this has been great. Thanks a lot for coming on, for sharing, you know, so much sort of experience and wisdom here. You bet. It was a pleasure. And I'm happy to do this again. And thanks everybody for tuning in and I hope you join us for the next one. Thanks for listening to The Secure Developer. That's all we have time for today. For additional episodes and full transcriptions, visit mydevsecops.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or get involved in the community, you can also find us on Twitter at at mydevsecops. 
Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed today's episode. Bye for now. Bye for now.